without understanding the institution left over from the Cultural Revolution, people would not understand China's economic reform because the whole thing started from the inherited institutions from the Cultural Revolution. So here the key is really regionally decentralized totalitarian system in the sense that all the local governments, all the different levels of local governments have the resources and uh, uh, control what they are going to do. My name is Chen Gang Xu. I'm a professor of economics at CKGSB, uh, which is a uh, private uh, business school uh, in China. When people claim that uh, the rise of China is uh, the uh, biggest uh, event uh, in the recent uh, economic history in the world, the qualification is the following. Uh, if we look at the issues uh, from the uh, point of view of the total GDP, so within 30 years, in terms of a growth rate of total GDP, uh, China has uh, break the uh, record. And then the other issue is, uh, the other qualification is poverty relief. So within this uh, 30 years of time, the largest uh, poverty relief happened in China. So uh, that is a, a very important issue. And then the third aspect is the uh, <clears throat> relative economic development. The so-called relative economic development is, uh, is measured by the per capita GDP compared with the world frontier. So for example, if we take the United States per capita GDP as world frontier, then comparing with the world frontier from the beginning of this 30 years uh, to the end of this 30 years. So what is the change level? So actually these uh, three aspects are closely related. Number one issue is the, the population of China. So given China is the most uh, populous nation, given the, pop the size of population, and then uh, once you have a uh, fast uh, uh, relative economic growth, uh, the growth of relative economic development, and then you have uh, this uh, total GDP uh, increase. So these are uh, uh, intimately related. And another intimately related issue is that at the very beginning of the Chinese economic reform, China was one of the poorest nations. So this is a, actually a key point. Uh, so when the reform started, if we are talking about uh, relative, relative economic development level, uh, China was about something like uh, one twentieth of the U.S. level. So that's significantly below the level of the average Africa per capita GDP. We are talking about uh, a such a very, very low level. So it's a desperately, desperately poor. So starting from this very low level, and then after 30 years, nowadays uh, the Chinese uh, relative development level is uh, close to one quarter of the U.S. level. So started from one twentieth up to uh, nearly one quarter. So in that, in that sense, it's a huge change. Uh, so if we only look at these factors, then yes, uh, uh, this is the biggest event in economic history. But uh, some other claims are uh, without the qualification can be exaggerations. <clears throat> So when people uh, talk China as a superpower, for example, if we look at the per capita GDP level, it's uh, less than one quarter of the U.S. level. Uh, so uh, if we compare China with the Soviet Union at its peak time, uh, uh, Soviet Union was more significantly more than one third of the U.S. per capita GDP level. So China is still uh, below that level. Uh, so. Uh, um, we have to keep in mind uh, uh, in our understanding. And also, when we talk about this uh, uh, growth rate, the key point is that the starting point was very, very low.
That's actually that's terribly important. So without understanding that, uh, talking about uh, the rise of China uh, can be misleading. So because uh, at the beginning, uh, China was so weak, uh, so uh, uh, poor. <laughs> so in general, the whole national economy is uh, is in at a poverty level. So when we talk about uh, this uh, growth achievement uh, in China in the recent uh, four decades, we always uh, associate with this with the economic reform. So why reform? So this is the key issue actually. So at the beginning of the uh, uh, establishment of the People's Republic of China, uh, uh, the Chinese per capita GDP level relative to the U.S. level was uh, uh, one of the 20th. When the reform started, the level is about the same, the relative development level. It's uh, slightly uh, higher, but it's so marginal, so basically we could uh, ignore that. So the, uh, in 1950, the level was 5% uh, of the U.S. level. In the 1980, it was uh, 6% of the U.S. level. So basically, uh, there was no uh, substantial uh, change uh, in the first 30 years of the People's Republic of China. So then, w w why reform is so important? It's so clear that uh, um, before the reform, uh, basically, there's no catch up. Uh, and also, we know that uh, what happened uh, before uh, the e economic reform. So there were two disastrous uh, movements. One is the Great Leap Forward movement, and the other is the Cultural Revolution. Uh, so reform means no Great Leap Forward movement, no Cultural Revolution, and uh, the whole way of organizing the economy has to be changed. So there is a sort of a misleading explanation about China, saying that China was a centrally planned economy and then changing to a market economy. This is not quite accurate. Uh, the so-called centrally planned economy usually, by describing in this way, implies the Soviet model. China. Uh, when, uh, 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 it, since 1950, when China established this uh, uh, People's Republic uh, of China, established this system, they fully implemented or copied the Soviet model. Uh, but uh, since 1958, China has changed the institution. So it's no longer a Soviet type of centrally planned economy anymore. So the institution has been changed, the centrally planned being abandoned. So it becomes a administratively a plan, a planned but not centrally planned economy. So I characterize that kind of system as a regionally decentralized totalitarian system because in the political economy, the Soviet system is described as a totalitarian system. China changed that a little bit uh, uh, in terms of uh, administration. So although the, the whole the, uh, economy, the overall society is governed in a totalitarian way, but in terms of uh, administration, in terms of uh, uh, resource allocation, is regionally decentralized in the sense that uh, the local governments uh, control substantial amount of resources and they manage their local economies. So based upon this institution, so there are two waves of changing from the Soviet system into this kind of a Ch Chinese type of administratively uh, planned economy, which I call the regionally decentralized totalitarian system. So based upon this kind of institution, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, the economic reform started. Then in the earlier decades of the economic reforms, the major strategy is regional competition. So this so-called regional competition is qualitatively different from market competition. Here the competition 
is not in the sense of a profit maximization. It's not in the sense of competition in the market. Instead, these are a sort of a tournament competition that the local governments are ranked. So they compete for ranking. They compete to become number one. So for example, within the city, you have several, uh, sorry, about 10 counties, and the counties uh, within the city, they wanted to become number one. They compete for the number one position. And within a province, you are going to have roughly about 10 cities, and each city is, they are competing each other. They want to be the number one in the province. And in the whole nation, you have a little bit more than 30 provincial level regions. They compete each other as well. And here the key issue is what are the targets of the competition? So at the earlier stages of the economic reform, the competition target is GDP growth rate. And turns out this is a very effective approach in terms of promoting the uh, economic reform and the growth. So this is how the reform is associated with growth, or growth is associated with reform. Because uh, in order to grow, uh, the regional governments have to find uh, their way. So to grow actually is a, is a big challenge. How to grow? This is a big challenge. Uh, so. At the very beginning of the reform, there were lots, lots of emphasis on the reform of the state sectors. But turns out that is not working well. That didn't work well. And the first successful reform was in agriculture. Actually, it involves the land reform. It's a partial privatization. Partial means there is no fundamental change in ownership, but the using rights have been privatized. So with using rights and also the exchange of using rights, these are privatized. So based upon that, there is a sort of industrial revolution in the sense of the rural industrial development. So in, at a very early stage of the economic reform, most of the uh, uh, growth actually occurred in this area, the so-called township village enterprises, starting from a very low base uh, up to the mid-1990s. The largest sector is this sector in the ch whole Chinese economy. And that actually is also the base uh, for the private sector when the private sector uh, became uh, partially legalized in the 1990s. So then in the whole 1990s and early 21st century, uh, China had a very uh, 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 rapid growth of the private sector. From zero to nowadays uh, is more than half of the GDP being produced by the private sector. So if we look at the Chinese constitution, both the state constitution and the party's constitution, then we find that by constitutions, party constitution and the state constitution, private sector was not allowed. Until 2002, the change of a party's constitution, and 2004, the change of the state constitution. So until the early 21st century, uh, uh, private sector was not legal. However, up to that point, the private sector was already half of the GDP. So if we are talking about uh, uh, the so-called China miracle, what is the miracle? This is the miracle.